Welcome and thank you for coming. I'm Luis Jaramillo, the Associate Chair of the Writing Program. Um, this is part of our ongoing series of food writing. And we're absolutely thrilled to have Judith Jones, who um, is here tonight. Uh, yeah, somebody who, uh, if it wasn't for her, their food writing as a genre really wouldn't exist, um, which is true. Yeah. <laughs> Not at all. 50 years ago. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Um, and for, right, so for more than 40 years, she's developed a really amazing list of cookbook authors, including Julia Child, um, but also Nancy Verdi Barr, Lydia Bastianich, James Beard, Marion Cunningham, Marcella Hazan, Mater Jaffrey, Irene Kuo, Edna Lewis, Joan Nathan, Jacques Pepin, Claudia Rodin, Nina Simons, Anna Thomas, many others. And of course, she's also had, um, novelists, as, uh, including John Updike and Ann Tyler. So a really amazing career as an editor of cookbooks, novels, um, biographies, nonfiction. Um, oh, and also I discovered when I was reading The Tenth Muse that she was the person responsible for bringing the diary of Anne Frank to the United States also when the translation came across her desk um, when she was working at Doubleday in Paris in um, 1951. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so really an amazing literary life. So we'll, we'll, um, I'm really looking forward to being able to talk about writing, food, food and writing. Um, and as uh, Judith Jones puts it, the language of cooking. Um, so again, please welcome <laughs> Judith Jones, um, uh, the winner of the Lifetime Achievement Awards from Bon Appetit, the James Beard Foundation and the IACP. You might well ask what prompted me to write a book when uh, I've worked with so many wonderful writers and uh, learned so much from them. But uh, I, I was tempted partly because I came upon some letters that I had written when I was all of, I think, 24 years old and went to Paris. And I was, went for a short vacation supposed to be three weeks, and I stayed three and a half years. And it was wonderful getting to know this person that was me then. She seemed so uh, sort of manipulative, writing her parents, trying to convince them that uh, you didn't spend all that money to give me an expensive education for me to become a cook. I mean, it, it's very hard for us to realize, or for you, young as you are, uh, that how cooking and food and food writing just wasn't, it didn't exist. So anyway, that's what kind of prompted me to write it. And uh, that was two years ago. And at the end of it, I'll just read you this passage because it's what really led into the book that, that has just been published. Uh, this is in the last chapter. After Evan, my husband, died in the winter of 1996, I doubted that I would ever find pleasure in making a nice meal for myself and sitting down to eat it all alone. I was wrong. Instead, I realized that the ritual we had shared together for almost 50 years was a part of the rhythm of my life, and by honoring it, I kept alive something that was deeply ingrained in our relationship. In fact, more than ever, I found myself, about mid-afternoon, letting my mind drift toward what I was going to conjure up for dinner that night when I got home. Instead of walking into an, what might have seemed an empty apartment, I gravitate toward the kitchen. And as I did as a young girl, basking in Edie's warmth, she was our maid housekeeper, I can't wait to bring it to life to fill it with good smells, to start chopping and whisking or tossing and smelling up my hands with garlic. I turn on some music, have a glass of Campari or wine, and it is for me the best part of the day, a time for relaxation. When at last I sit down and light the candles, the place across from me is not empty. And at the back of this book, 
I had, oh, a selection of recipes, less, less than 50, of sort of different phases of my life. I mean, some things I remembered from childhood and, and uh, from my first years in France and then when we first got a place in northern Vermont. And, but the last section was on cooking alone. And so many people came up to me and said, I just loved you, really inspired me to get back in the kitchen and be good to myself, treat myself well and to enjoy it. And uh, then they said, what's a good book? And particularly young people just starting off and having a tiny kitchen for the first time. They'd say, how do you get started? How do you not waste? You buy all this stuff and maybe you cook once in the week and then you throw it all out. And they wanted to know if there was a book to help them. And the truth is that there are books on the subject, but they're usually just reducing a dish for one. And it's something quite different. It's a whole strategy you have to develop if you really want to make it work. And so I decided to sort of observe myself for a year and, and put down my strategy and try to convey my pleasure, as well as to bring in some of the people that I've worked with and, as I say, learned so much from. And uh, there'll always be the naysayers. All that work just for me or their eyes kind of glaze over. And then you have to do all those pots and pans, nah. But you're not gonna reach them, I know. What, this, this is for people who really want good food and taste something delicious in a little bistro they've had and think, wouldn't it be fun to go home and make a nice omelet like that? And who, in other words, I'm reaching out to you, but you have to re meet me part of the way, <laughs> if you see what I mean. And the people who just want it quick and easy, this book isn't for them. <laughs> so, so uh, I, I talked about strategy, and what I mean by that is that the supermarkets are stacked against you. They want you to buy a huge bunch of of parsley and you just want to chop a little teaspoonful on a white piece of fish and so you say, mm, $1.99 for that and it's all going to go in the garbage. Uh, or you, you, the meat is in a package of two or three chops and you go up to the butcher and ask if they'll oh, let you have one. Sometimes they will, but mostly they make you feel like a poor little beggar. And I, I just got to press shopping because I was fighting something I couldn't, I couldn't change. And so I thought, okay, we'll go with them, buy the whole package, but find, th look at it as a, a meal you start with and then the ways that you're going to reincarnate those lamb, the, that extra lamb chop. And you start thinking of all those delicious dishes that use wonderful things like barley or dried beans or even a rice dish, and how you're going to turn that second chop into one of those nice little dishes later in the week. So you think through the week, you think, what days am I gonna be home? And you think uh, how one dish leads into another. And you, I also think about the tastes I'd like. Season has a lot to do with it. When the first asparagus comes in, I think it's sinful to eat asparagus in, in December. But, so you wait for it, you want to celebrate with it. Or the first, you can also, because you're only cooking for yourself, you can give yourself a, a wonderful extravagant treat once in a while. I can't wait for the first soft shell crabs to be in the market, and I go home and make myself a wonderful salt. This is very easy. You dust them with, with flour and sizzle them in butter and put a little lemon on. That's all, but it's one of the most delicious things. So uh, that, that, that is really the strategy that I've worked out. There's still things I can't lick like that bunch of parsley. But you know what I've done recently? I've gotten little pots of herbs I use most of like a little pot of parsley, a little pot of basil. And uh, I have one good sunny window, 
and I keep them there. So that's a way. Another way is sometimes oh, making a pesto or a large amount of pesto and putting small amounts of it into an ice cube tray. And then when it's frozen, you just open the ice cube tray and, and you have one or two at the ready when you need them. I do that with a lot of things. I do that with a, a chicken broth or, a, or a, a, also tomato sauce. I always now, I'm like the supermarket. I make more than I need because I want to have that little, those golden treasures in the refrigerator. And it, it has shifted the whole emphasis. And I, that, that is sort of my way of beating the system. But on the positive side too, uh, think of the money you save, particularly if you start thinking this way. Uh, think of the fact that you're in charge of what you're eating and you're not, you, you don't know what's in that frozen dinner and all these ersatz products. It's so much healthier to, to you know, get, sh and, and once in a while, treat yourself to, uh, to, I don't know the expressions they use, but homegrown or farm-raised chicken and things like that. Spend that little extra because it is just for you. And maybe you can go without meat or without something extravagant another night. So you're, you're very much in charge. And you learn from your mistakes. If the sauce curdles, well, you eat it anyway. And you think, well, next time I shouldn't have had the flame so high. And so in the process, you're really teaching yourself to cook. And you get more and more confident. And I feel too many cookbooks are so rigid and recipes are treated as scientific formulas, which they aren't, that I think you need to loosen up. You need to use all your senses to taste, to smell, to see if the meat springs back at you when it's done just a point. Uh, and <coughs> gradually, you become quicker and more confident and you create your own <laughs> dishes and, and uh, find substitutes when you know, something is either too expensive or you don't have it. And in the whole process, you, you, you become your own cook. Uh, I've just done a book by Jason Epstein, who is about as old as I am. He's been in publishing for 50 years, too. And he's been a wonderful, innovative publisher. And uh, he also loved to cook all his life. And his little book is called Eating. And it's really sort of fragments of his life, but it's told through telling the story of a recipe. And he's talking to you while he's at the stove, and he's giving you the recipe. And uh, I asked him why he didn't want to extract in ingredients. And he said, because you never do the same thing twice. <laughs> and uh, in fact, usually, the second time round, you're doing it better. So why, why freeze it? Why write it down? And uh, so there's a, there's a fine middle ground there. And each of us finds his or her own way. I've also, uh, in this book, because as I say, I've been very privileged to work with some really wonderful writers. And I, I had a theory after we published Julia Child and companies uh, mastering the art of French cooking, that uh, she, she, Julia particularly, because she was the writer of the book, convinced me that you need to teach technique. You need to understand what you're doing in order to do it well. There's no other art form, and cooking is an art. I hope my mother up there is hearing me. <laughs> Uh, there's no other art form that you don't learn the fundamentals. So don't resist a Julia Child recipe because it looks long. Because what she has done is teach you all the right things to make a perf perfect beef bourguignon instead of just a boiled beef stew. And once you've read it, it's imprinted on that cooking brain of yours and you can draw on it and, and go your own way, but it's there forever. So after 
and the success of that book, I felt, you know, we need to do the same thing with particularly more foreign cuisines like Middle Eastern, Indian, Chinese, uh, you name it. And there you're really flying blind because you didn't grow up in that cooking tradition and you need somebody there in the kitchen kind of holding your hand. And so, so I really spent most of my, my life as a cookbook editor, although I'm a general editor, but in that area, I wanted to find people who could tell their story and uh, teach you to understand a foreign cuisine and to be able to adapt it and do it in your own kitchen. And as a result, uh, well, you read off some of the, the authors, but many of them were women who had left the, the land of their, their birth and their childhood and felt that they reconnected through food, through recipes. Claudia Roden, writing about Middle Eastern food, you feel that intense attachment to her childhood and uh, when she, when her family had to leave Cairo, she wrote to all kinds of relatives and friends, a whole network of Middle Eastern people uh, to get those recipes. And I think she writes about it with such nostalgia. And food is that great communicator in the sense that it calls up those memories and brings them to life again. Uh, Am I drifting? Am I talking too long? Do no, that was all. I, w I was going to just read you uh, one passage, or actually I had Mark too, if it's not too long. But I love this, and I do, I do try to tell some little stories about people I worked with and learned from. And one of my favorite writers was a man named Ed Joby. He was a painter, an Italian painter and a first-generation American. And he was a wonderful gardener and a, a cook to die for. It was just so natural to him. And uh, he was telling me, what we were talking about mussels, and he said, when I was growing up, uh, mussels, they were trash food. Nobody would think of eating them. But it was the Italians who went over to the coast and would spend a whole day gathering mussels. And so I said, put that story down. So this is how we wrote it. During the Depression, my father, my godfather, Tommaso, and his father and all their friends would drive to New Haven, Connecticut to gather mussels. They gathered mussels most of the year and they gathered them by the bushel, bringing them home and tied securely on the running board of the old Model T, one of them owned. My father used to take me with him, and I remember all the wonderful discoveries I made while gathering the mussels. The fascinating tidal pools teeming with life, the snails, the starfish, and an occasional horseshoe crab. It was worlds apart from the drab factory town I, we lived in. The women would be waiting for our return, then they would wash the mussels, laughing and gossiping all the while and prepare the sauces and stuffing for them. The men would deftly open the mussels with their pocket knives, and they all had pocket knives, as they drank my father's wine, smoked Italian cigars, and chatted about their gardens or their own wine. I suppose I remember those occasions because they were joyous, and I tend to think of the Depression with some nostalgia. <laughs> it's, a, it's just wonderful the way he put that down. And then this, this is just, it was a little head note to a recipe, because I told a few people this story and they all loved it. So I used to go up a lot to Cambridge to, to work with Julia, and so this came out of that. Once when I was up in Cambridge working all day nonstop with Julia Child, as we often did, it was almost 11 p.m. when she finally swept away the manuscript and announced we'd make dinner. Then she turned to me and said, Judith, <laughs> you make a nice little potato dish while I fix the meat. Slightly unnerved, I managed to rise to the occasion and put together what I would call a 
fast stovetop version of the classic potato zana. As I mashed some garlic and salt together and smeared this between the layers of sliced potatoes, Julia was looking on a bit skeptically. <laughs> and uh, although I used lots of butter, of which she always approved, it wasn't clarified butter. <laughs> but when we sat down and she took her first bite, she pronounced the potatoes delicious. And her husband, Paul, toasted me. I was in cook's heaven. <laughs> So there's a potato dish just for one, if you want to make it. Uh, so that gives you a little flavor of what I've tried to do with these books. I'd love to have you read this section to the language of cooking. Oh, yeah. Cooking is a sensual experience, and you really should allow all of your senses full play. Enjoy the feel of ingredients. Observe what is happening. Taste as you go along and drink in the heady smells that arouse your anticipation. Then, when you set everything on a plate, even if it's just for you, or especially if it's just for you, make it pleasing to the eye, adding a little color to brighten if needed. I feel the language of recipes should reflect the visceral nature of cooking and invite you to participate more fully rather than have you slavishly following a formula. That's why I use expressions like a pinch of salt, a splash of wine, a sprinkling of garlic, a sprinkling of parsley, a fat clove of garlic, and a handful of spinach leaves. Then I insisted on having a hand showing the salt in it, showing a teaspoon of salt, so that you get the feel in your hand and pretty soon, your hand is telling you what a teaspoon is. It doesn't happen the first time, but it happens. Then you don't need to be putting it in it, <laughs> leveling it out. <laughs> I think you have more fun that way. Um, so you've written cookbooks before, but um, most of them have been with your husband. But how was it different to write this cookbook? It was very unnerving, because I felt so exposed. <laughs> But you have, to, you have to forget that. And I didn't grow up on computers, and I really don't much like working in front of a screen. So I found the best way was after I'd had my dinner and a glass of wine, just to take a long yellow pad and write as though I were writing a letter to somebody. And I began to that really released me, and I began to get going. I guess the answer is another question I had, which is that um, you've been, you've led a very busy life. <laughs> and so if you're an editor, that means you bring home manuscripts also and read them at home. So how do you find time to cook and write if you're reading all day and working all day? I find time because it's important to me. You, mm -hmm. you find time for what you want to do. In fact, what are we saving all that time for? <laughs> to, to watch another television series or, or to, uh, what is the word? Twitter? It's Twitter. <laughs> Although you do have a blog, I just found out. I, I do have a blog, so I'm not as, as pure as you think. <laughs> JudithJonesCooks.com? Yeah. Is that that com. Com. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's more or less, it's about these things. It's, it's more kind of reflections on food and, and trying to get some back and forth going. And I've gotten some good responses, but when I asked if anybody knew how to cook a beef heart, I didn't get a single answer. <laughs> <laughs> you can guess why. <laughs> so I, I just had to follow my instincts. <laughs> Incidentally, I do with my cousin, who is a farmer up in Vermont. We're raising grass-fed uh, beef so that I have the privilege of eating wonderful beef and knowing that it hasn't, nothing has passed through that animal that shouldn't. <laughs> um, do you have questions? I have more too, but yeah, go ahead. How did, what? How did the beef heart turn out? It turned out, you know, I remembered a recipe that my husband had done for his daughter's birthday when she turned 16. 
she was a brave girl. And it was called, he was a Welshman, and it was called Love in Disguise. And you can guess what the love was, <laughs> the heart. <laughs> then they were stuffed, but they were veal hearts, which are much more tender than, than the beef, because they, they're almost two years old when they go to market. So I just did the memory of that stuffing and putting it in sort of, in, working, made slices and worked it in. And then I just cooked it very slowly and I kept testing it. I cooked it almost two and a half hours. It was delicious. And people who sort of gagged on the idea, I had, I think I had about six people for dinner. I had offered them some ribs too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they ate it and liked it. The back. What's your opinion on dry herbs? On diet? Dry herbs. Dry, dry herbs. Oh, dry herbs. I see nothing wrong with, with most. Some don't dry very well. And, but I think that things like thyme and uh, those uh, Provencal seasonings, things like that, I think they're delicious. And the thing is not to buy too huge an amount. Uh, particularly if you're alone, because it takes you time to use it all up. Uh, and uh, I get irritated at these chef's books that call for three different kinds of fresh herbs, and you've spent as much on the fresh herbs as you have on what you're <laughs> cooking them with. And uh, so I believe in the winter, absolutely use. And just gauge yourself. You use probably about a quarter as much. You know, some of these recipes are adapted from um, people you've worked with, like Lydia Bastianich. Mm -hmm. So how did you make them for one person? Was it trial and error? Or well, first I know? asked Lydia, and she, <laughs> I said, could you make this for one? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you And then she said, but she did say, if you do, be sure to keep the pan moist. So I knew by that that I needed a small pan and to be sure that there was enough liquid in this particular dish I was making. Uh, and it, so you're, you're adjusting size as well as the ingredients. Mm -hmm. That's really the secret of it. Over here. How do you uh, counsel the people who seem to be squeamish about things like eating meat and God forbid butter? Eating butter. <laughs> using, using how, cook. how can you cook well without using butter? <laughs> I mean, you know, the 90s, we really went through that fear of fat hysteria. And you just wait long enough. And of course, pretty soon they were saying, well, butter and even pure pork <coughs> fat is so much better for you than those, what is it, hydrogen, hydrogen right. pro products like oleo margarine. <laughs> Julia Child wouldn't dignify Oleo with a name. She, she used to say, that other spread. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really believe in, I'm, I'm following Julia here, but in eating a little bit of everything, uh, knowing when you've had enough, and uh, not eating between meals, and if you tend to put on weight, resisting seconds. But it's all, a, and, and each of us is different, but it is that balance between intake and output. So do a little more gym so you can have <laughs> that, that extra piece of butter. Don't you feel that way? Can't live, can't live without butter. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Um, as someone who's launched so many food rankers, what's your advice for people today when you I mean, you'd argue it's sort of an oversaturated market, like how to break through the clutter and be successful. And to write about food. Mm -hmm. It's a tough one. I, it really is. And I'm just, I think it's too bad that in the recent years, all the cookbooks and the, most of the books about food have been uh, people who are successful on TV and all the emphasis on 
competition and testosterone in the kitchen and it's sort of but I think the very fact that, that so many young people are going after mastering the art of French cooking, I think the pendulum is swinging. However, it's tough to, to sell cookbooks today, particularly because a lot of people just go and they buy their first chicken for roasting and they Google it. They don't care whose recipe it is, but it's easier that way. And so I, I think a lot is going to change and publishers are going to have to work more with the internet, but in, in terms of getting the person featured who, whose recipe it is. And, but to, to get started in this area, you have to build some kind of platform to get your, your name a little bit noticed. I, there still are three or four good food magazines. Uh, I think the loss of Gourmet was really sad, but maybe somebody will pick it up and start it over again. Uh, so, and I think even if you have a subject that you want to write about and that's a little different, maybe try, uh, you know, we, communicating through the internet to get, get yourself established. I've seen that happen with, there's this one uh, blog that I really like called The City Cook. And, and uh, I think she just started out that way and got more and more of a following. Look at Julie. <laughs> I don't consider her that much of a cook, but look at the following she got with her blog. You should read Orange Jet. Do you ever read her, Molly Weisenberg? Is what? Molly Weisenberg's blog, Orange Jet. She's also a columnist for Bon Appetit. Mm, yeah. She's really good. Yep. Yeah. Um, Hi, I have two questions. Thank you, by the way. Um, one is how do you feel about, you were talking a little bit about cooking around the world, and I'm Caribbean, and we use a lot of, like, for example, iron pots, or, you know, in other places, how do you feel about the importance of the um, instrument that you're using to cook in terms of flavoring and seasoning in, in food? And then the other part was about teaching children to cook. Like I went through a whole lot of kids' books, and I understand like we should have fun, but I think it's very important. Mm -hmm. I think it is art. important. Mm -hmm. yeah. so kind of your thoughts on that. Can you try yeah, the, the, the beginning? Of yeah, the yeah, I don't hear it terribly well. Uh, the first part of the question was. Uh, She's from the Caribbean, and mm -hmm. in the Caribbean, you use iron pots and clay pots a lot. So mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about using that sort of specific kind of cookware mm -hmm. um, to impart flavor and nutrients, too, actually? I, th I think that your pots become a part of who you are as a cook. I think we all have our favorite pots, and uh, it very often reflects the nature of the cooking, the long, slow cooking. I remember when I came back from France after that three and a half year stay, the one thing I brought back was a little iron cocotte. Because I knew I'd never find one here. I mean, everybody was after light aluminum in those days. And, uh, and I was so attached to it because I had learned to cook things that I liked with it, like and uh, clay too. I don't think we know enough about clay in in this country. We don't use it that much. That's probably that'd be an interesting subject to pursue. And as for cooking with children, I think it's so important that they're exposed at an early age. And and by somebody who likes to cook. <laughs> uh, because they, they, they just, it's contagious, and they learn by watching, and they feel when the time comes for them to do things, they feel, they feel confident. Hello? I have a question in a totally different vein, but what was it like to come upon the diary of Anne Frank and to publish it? Oh, the Anne Frank? Yeah. Well, I was, towards the end of my stay in Paris, I was working for a Doubleday editor who had come over to establish a Doubleday office there to scout and look at European books. And 
I heard about it and I went there as his assistant or his little girl Friday and uh, I'd worked several months with him. I had worked for Double Dan New York before I, I went to Europe, which helped because they knew me. And uh, anyway, one day he was going off to lunch and there was a pile of manuscripts and there was a, a book. It was in French and it hadn't been, uh, it was a, 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 an advanced copy of the book. And uh, he said, just will you get, I've, I've looked at these, will you write rejection letters? So I did and then got to this book and it had the face of Anne Frank on it so I couldn't resist starting to read. And I read, and I read all afternoon. I was still there when he came home in the evening. I said, you've got to get this book to New York, because it's so moving and special. Now, you know, that sounds as though only I had the eye for it, and I don't mean that at all, but it was a different time. The Holocaust wasn't talked about that much, and particularly in France, it was sort of slow coming. And also, I think there's a sort of prejudice, oh, a book by an adolescent girl, you know, it's going to be a, a book, a juvenile, a book for, for young people. And I found out that it was turned down by several publishers in New York, it had been. But it was just that I allowed myself to get into it and, and really read it, and you, uh, you, you couldn't help. No, that this would, you have to trust your own instincts as an editor. And that was when I trusted. <laughs> was it hard then to get people in New York to buy it? I mean, did you have to fight for it? Or no, I, I, that's why I said I had worked for Double Day in New York. So Ken McCormick, the editor in chief, knew me, and, you know, it wasn't as though it helped because I had worked there. So. I got a hearing. And then there was an editor here who loved it, too. Other questions about writing and editing? I have not more. But you know, the uh, speaking of that, Mastering the Art of French Cooking, they worked on it for years, Julia and her two French cohorts. And finally it was brought to Houghton Mifflin. Houghton Mifflin had it. And advance on it. They'd seen some of it in a small small advance. And they read it, and the men of the company called Mrs. Child in. She was over here from Europe and said, oh, Mrs. Child, no American woman wants to know that much about French cooking. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> And again, I was lucky. I was working for Alfred Knopf. It was a small house then. Alfred loved food and wine. He was very much the connoisseur, the kind of connoisseur who never goes in the kitchen, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but he let me have my chance, and so well, that was lucky too. And that was the first cookbook. Hmm? That was your first cookbook, also. It was the first one that I really did myself, yeah. Yes. What was the most uh, challenging cookbook that you've ever had to edit? Was it the first one, the Mastering Art of Cooking? No. Uh, mastering, uh, Julia thought it out so well. Even the way she wanted the ingredients to appear on the page when you use them. And it's useful when the recipe is four pages, five pages long <laughs> because you're going back to. So, uh, no, that. She was wonderful to work with, and uh, who's the most difficult? I would say Marcella Hazan was the most mm. difficult, just because she was, and she, she and Victor were, uh, as the French would say, of folie à deux. They were so, <laughs> and I would make a small comment that I had, I, I get very involved in the cookbooks that I work with. I, I don't think they were used to that. And I think I made something and I felt it had too much fat in it, but it, <laughs> it, it sort of pools of it. And, and particularly bolognese cooking can be very rich that way. And I just suggested that maybe 
And I remember Marcella t turning to Victor and saying, what did she say? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we decided in the end we weren't suited to one another. Yeah. I did some good books with her. She was a wonderful cook, but uh, <laughs> difficult. <laughs> Do you get more involved in your cookbooks than in oh, your other books? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Because, I'll tell you why, uh, I feel it is so important that each person has a voice, a very definite voice, and I want to try to draw that out. In contrast, when I started working with Lydia Bastianich, she had, she'd had somebody uh, work with her before, but she pretty much turned over the recipes. And I wanted to hear her, and particularly when she first started on television, and I had been to Philidia, her restaurant, a number of times, and met her, and she was such a, when she talked about food, and, and it just drew you in, in a way that I, I loved. And so, I, sort of, I, I really would go and watch her cook, particularly uh, as she was developing a book, and asked questions. Why are you doing that? And uh, she loved it. I mean, she said, you gave me my voice. <laughs> I'd sometimes hear that voice at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'd come into New York, visited her restaurants, gone around, talked to all her clients, and she'd drive home, and to relax, she'd get on the computer and develop that voice. <laughs> I do think energy is a large source of success, don't you? Mm, absolutely. I mean, Julia had that energy. She has that energy. It's wonderful. Do you feel good like food? You see, good it food be keeps you going. Is that the well, well stoked. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I like the idea of uh, helping your cookbook authors find their own voices. Yeah. Is it, it must be hard sometimes to get them to trust what they want to say. Yes, and very often, you know, <coughs> writing isn't the thing that they do easily, and they very often, particularly chefs, turn their books over to a hired writer. And that's why they just end up as formulas. I, I love to quote my pet peeve, shall I? In a bowl, combine the first mixture with the second mixture. <laughs> How many times have you read that? <laughs> and you look around, oh, what do they mean by combine? I, I guess they mean mix, okay. Uh, and you look around for the first mixture, and you finally realize that it's the milk that's been heated with a little salt in it. It's become a mixture. <laughs> and then you go looking for second mixture, can't they use language? <laughs> Over here? I think there's a, oh. been a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. There. Uh, I'm just curious about what you thought of the film, Julia and Julia, and what you thought of Meryl Streep's performance. Uh, oh, of Meryl Streep's performance. Mm -hmm. Also, what? you were portrayed in the film. Yes. yes. <laughs> I didn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> she was all right, but she didn't. She didn't look like somebody in the early 50s mm. somehow. But anyway, <laughs> I thought Meryl Streep was brilliant in terms of getting the essence of Julia. I think sometimes it was a kind of one note. And having known Julia very well, there was a dead serious side to her. And I think he just got, woo, woo, woo. <laughs> I, 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 you can see I do it a little bit too. It's a temptation. <laughs> but it's a movie, and I, I've often said to writers when they do sell something to a movie, you've let it go, it's in other hands, it's become something else. Don't try to control, because you can't. Right. Well, that was yeah. your book also with Alex Prudhomme and Julia, mm -hmm. My Life in France. Yes. So that was your book also that was made into a movie. I mean, well, that was, you know, they used it with the... And that was very clever, I thought, of Nora Ephron, because I think she saw that it would be a much 
better movie by showing these two loves that were parallel, but not so, but when you come down to it, not really parallel. And I think she made a movie out of thin material, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think My Life in France would have been a better movie, but no, um. that's not my business. <laughs> Did you really not show up for dinner in that one time? Did I what? Did you not show up for dinner the one time where you were invited to dinner? To, uh, yeah, well, that's pretty mean because <laughs> they make me sort of a nasty, petty person who couldn't go out in the rain just because I was old. <laughs> the truth of it is that I was supposed to go out and see her. I hardly knew what a blog was, and I wanted to see how she was using the material what her rights were and so on. So I was going as an editor. And uh, <clears throat> I told Julia, she was living in California then, it was during the last years of her life. And, uh, I, and she said, well, we better look at the blog. So we looked at it, <laughs> we both looked at it, and <laughs> got on the phone. And she said, she can't be serious. <laughs> She's just using me. And uh, then she said, oh, we both agreed that we, maybe it's our generation, but the four letter words to describe food is there's something lacking. I mean, you can't be seriously interested in food if that's the, that's the language you have to use. So she said, don't have anything to do with her. So I canceled, but uh, not as good a movie. <laughs> So I'm the villain there, but at least I'm the, I'm the savior for Julia. <laughs> <laughs> yes? My uh, remembrance of the, the recipes in Julia's book was that a lot of them were very complicated. And I just couldn't believe that she could cook her way through that whole book, which had, what, over 500 recipes? Mm -hmm. in, in one year, unless she stayed up and cooked all night long? I know, and then the and she, job, she had a full-time job full then. Yeah. Get home yeah. Start yeah. Well, you'll have to take that off with Julie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. In your personal cooking, do you cook from cookbooks or recipes or, or personal preferences? And if you do use cookbooks, who do you like? W which ones I like? Yeah. Well, I have to be careful because I'm kind of like a mother with a large brood. <laughs> and if I mention this person and that person and Somebody out there isn't mentioned. It's safer not to. And I, I try to <coughs> en encourage each person to have his or her own style, and as I say, a different voice. And uh, I will I will admit that when I'm working on a book, I sometimes almost get as compulsive as Julie, <laughs> because I. I now, Mother Joffrey is doing a new book. She did that wonderful introduction, the invitation to Indian cooking some years ago. And over, she's a, and she again had to leave the, her, the country of her childhood and missed it so that she wrote to her mother and got all these recipes. So she really learned to cook through them and was therefore a very good person to transcribe them to us. But over the years, she's realized that people tend to shy away from Indian cooking because the ingredients list is this long, and you make these, grind these pastes, and then you fry a paste, and you then toast the seeds, and so on. So she really has worked out a system for simplifying without dumbing down, and the recipes are just delicious. And I'm having such a good time just getting a little piece of fish and you may rub some spices on it and let it rest half an hour while you set the table and do a few chores, and then slip it under the broiler. But it just brings new, new excitement to your taste buds, all those flavors. So don't tell anybody else that I mentioned. <laughs> Did you mention her because she lives right around the corner, so she's the most likely to hear? <laughs> They have their spies. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yep. If you don't want to mention, what do you look for in a cookbook when you're looking at one to perhaps 
Mm -hmm. if you purchase them? Well, I, as I say, particularly if it's an area where I'm kind of flying blind, I may never even have tasted something I'm making. I want detail. I want to say what to expect. And if there's any little, uh, little technique along the way that's important, I want that explained to me. That's why I don't think in a bowl combine is uh, a good way of writing a recipe that, that you really want to know. And yeah, you want visceral language that, that really conveys the, the physical act, of, as I said. Uh, combining is hardly a word that was used so much. Nobody ever combined before. So um, that's, uh, that's what I look for. I really want to be helped to succeed in that recipe. And if it makes it a little longer, well, sometimes you can put general information into boxes or uh, remove it from the body of the recipe. So the ones who just want a quick answers aren't bothered by detail. But every, uh, each thing, each one is different. That's the fun. Yes? What do you think about the trend in cookbooks for you know, beautiful photography and sort of the whole trend of food porn? Um, that the cookbooks may not be so much oriented toward the text and more toward the, the visual experience. Do you think that takes away from the rest of the I'm not sure I got the beginning. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, what do you think about books that are more interested in the photography than the... Oh. I, again, I like photography that's much more hands-on and earthy and looks like the kind of thing that you and I would do in the kitchen. Uh, I think we went too far in that direction. And I think you look at them, you might say, that's lovely, but you have a feeling that you, it's a little too... too flossy, too manipulated, too arty for you, and I think it's a little off-putting. Another question just about observation. Try in a Manhattan kitchen to put one of those cookbooks anywhere and manage to cook, because they're all the size of an iron pan. I know, it is hard. You know. And then they keep, they don't stay open. <laughs> You can always tell your favorite recipe no. because it just opens to the to the splatters. No, I know, and we've got to compete with those little laptop computers that everybody's using now. We can't spill on them now. You can't. Yeah. They'll break. That's that's a good. Mm, where you can spill on your books and it, it shows that you've used them lovingly. Yeah. Do you, do you also like to go out to eat? And what are some of your favorite New York restaurants? I don't really like to go out to eat so much today because restaurants are so noisy. And I do have a hearing problem in my old age. And uh, it just, it, I, you know, it's just a cacophony sometimes. So I really like the peace of at home and having people in and, or, you can find quiet places and or go at late hours or there are ways around it, but I don't know. I think we got off on too much worship of what was going on in restaurants. Restaurants, it's like going to the theater. A good chef has to produce and surprise you. And, uh, and I think in doing so, sometimes they go too far. I really do not like these little tasting plates, one after the other after the other, and you end up, you've been at the restaurant three hours, you've had too much wine, and you long for a piece of bread. <laughs> Do you feel that way? <laughs> um, maybe one more question? Oh yeah, go ahead. I was wondering if, if you could say a little bit about where you think publishing is going, and if that's too big a question, maybe where it's going? Yeah, given the, the economic turmoil in, in the publishing industry mm -hmm. and the ease, ease with which people who want to publish can now publish on their own over the internet, where do you see the, the place of the editor 
in the future? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it certainly is a changing world, and it is an electronic world, and we have to work with it and find ways, creative ways, of working with it. Uh, what they are, I'm not sure, but that's why I'm blogging. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, the, the fact that the economy is so bad and food is so expensive, particularly in New York, uh, it, it, there's a plus to that because I think more people are going to be cooking at home and finding alternate ways of beating the system. I think we should all really start a movement to pressure supermarkets and particularly the good ones like healthy living to respect the fact that so many people live alone and package their things differently. And you know, we have to be aggressive. Take that package to the checkout and say, hey, I only want one chop. And if you're not gonna give it to me, I'm gonna go somewhere else. But it, it's not fun, is it? You don't, <laughs> you don't want to have those ugly encounters. <laughs> That's why I'm talking so much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think a call to arms is a good way to end the evening. <laughs> um, I hope there are books for sale at the backs. Uh, would you mind signing? No, no, not a bit. Very good. Um, so thank you for coming. Okay.